Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and I am back to do part two of my series about the science behind why humans may in fact be able to hear differences in audio cables. And we are talking specifically for the moment about analog cables, such as speaker cables, headphone cables, and line level interconnects with RCA and XLR terminations, those sorts of things. Now remember, to say that we can hear differences in audio cables does not necessarily mean that we will hear differences in audio cables all the time. And I will get to why that might be in a future part of this series. If you remember in part one, I outed myself as someone who can hear differences in audio cables, and I'm also a scientist, and I want to know why it is that I can hear differences in audio cables, even when measurements don't always show that we should be able to. So I have been digging into that and providing what I have learned to you, and I offer this to the audiophile community to be digested and dissected and to be mulled over so that we can all move forward and have a serious conversation about cables. All right, so cables matter part two. We need to talk about waves and wave superposition. Let's get into it. Quick shout out to Slides Carnival for providing the PowerPoint template for this. So the cool looking background that you get came from them to use their stuff. I need to cite them. So here is that citation. All right. If you remember in part one, we defined science, talked about what it is, some of the ways in which it is done and why it's so important. Here in this video, we are going to look at sound waves and wave superposition. And then in the near future, we'll come back and talk about things like alternating current signal transmission and pattern recognition, and then we'll tie all of that stuff together. But for right now, let's talk about waves and wave superposition. Recapping part one, we talked about science as both a way of knowing and a body of knowledge that results from that way of knowing. Science has a dual nature. It is important to realize that yes, we have learned a lot of things from science, but more importantly, it's that science has given us some methods, a bag of tools, if you will, to really learn things and deeply understand things about our universe. One way that we can learn some things about that universe is by doing measurements. And that's a big thing in audio right now. But we also need to remember that measurements are but one part of one small way of doing science. And just doing measurements is not itself doing science. I also argued that we humans have used our five senses, our ability to see, hear, smell, feel, and taste, although we have to be careful with how we use some of those. Even so, we have been using our senses to make sense, haha, -ha, of our physical universe and what's going on in the world around us. And we have been doing that since long before there was a thing called science. And we have been continuing to use our, our senses as part of doing science from the beginning. In this video, I want to talk about a little bit of knowledge that this process we call science has yielded as it applies to audio. And that is, of course, waves. So what is a wave? Well, somewhere in space and in time, something happens. That something is some form of a disturbance. It could be a rock or a tree branch falling into a still pond and then waves rippling across the surface away from that. It could be moving the end of a string up and down such as we see here on the right. It could be a nuclear reaction at the center of a star, exciting atoms, which kick out little balls of energy we call photons. The point is, as a disturbance happens somewhere in space and time, and there is energy associated with that disturbance. Now, we humans still are not fully clear on what energy is or where it comes from, but we do know that it travels in waves. So what is a wave? A wave is how energy travels through space and time. 
And waves travel in one of two ways. We, they either travel as a transverse wave or a longitudinal wave. What are these things? Well, a transverse wave is a wave in which the energy traveling will cause vibrations or oscillations or wiggles or waving in a direction that is perpendicular to the direction in which the energy is traveling. So in this little in, uh, animation here, the energy of the wave is traveling from left to right. And we see up atop with the transverse wave that the waving, that slinky looking thing, is oscillating up and down in a direction perpendicular to the direction in which that energy is traveling. <clears throat> waves like this are often electromagnetic waves. Okay? Light would be an example of a transverse wave. A longitudinal wave, such as we see at the bottom, has oscillations or wiggles or vibrations or waving that happens in the same direction or along the same line, or to say it in a fancy math way, parallel to the direction in which the energy of the wave is traveling. An example here would be sound waves, but there are other examples such as some earthquakes, meaning seismic waves can travel longitudinally. Some of them are also transverse, but those are just examples of longitudinal waves. So let's think about sound waves a little bit more then. Picture hitting a drum with drumsticks, like we see in this cute little gif right here. Striking the head of that drum with a drumstick causes a vibration in the drum head. That vibration is going to start pushing the air around it. And then on the other side, when the drum head swings back, moves back, vibrates back the other way, there's going to be a small little vacuum right in there where air was, but is no longer there because the drum head pushed it away. Well, keep repeating that because the drum head keeps vibrating and we get a wave specifically a pressure wave that looks something like this, where we see a bunch of air molecules that get clustered together. That's where the drum head is like, say, moving out, pushing on the air around it. And then in between those clusters, we get some areas where the air molecules are spread out because that's where the drum head moved back in and the air came in and filled it, getting ready to be pushed on the next vibration, so to speak. And so we have this energy, this wave of energy, these pressures moving through space and time. Now notice the little red dots where they're calling out individual particles here in our animation. They are not traveling with the wave. It turns out that each little individual air molecule doesn't actually travel from the drum to our ear. It mostly stays in the same spot. It just wiggles back and forth as the energy that is the wave travels through the space that they are occupying. All right, so eventually that pressure wave will reach our ear. Now we can model these pressure waves, these sound waves with a sine wave where the positive maximums, the peaks of this sine wave represent those spots where the air molecules have clustered together. And then the troughs or the negative maximums of the sine wave are where the air molecules have spread further apart. And this gives us a really convenient mathematical way to model any wave really, but here is how we're translating the longitudinal sound wave into a transverse sine wave mathematical model that it makes it a little easier to see and understand what's going on. So more about sound waves then, let's take that picture we just had on the previous slide and zoom in a little bit on that green sine wave and talk about its pieces a little bit. We don't need to go into super detail here other than to say that here are some of the important parts with some labels of the waves. So we see the red sine wave there and its position so that wherever we are on that red wave is some distance away from the center horizontal gray line there. The distance the wave is from that center gray line is just called the displacement. The maximum displacement of the wave is called the amplitude. 
Now the amplitude is directly connected to the amount of energy that is traveling in the form of a wave. Now the distance between like points of a wave is called the wavelength. And then of course the number of waves that happen per a given amount of time is called the frequency. And frequency is what we he humans hear as pitch. High frequency sounds mean high pitch or treble. Low frequency sounds mean low pitch or bass. Digging a little deeper, let's go back to our drum being struck here in space. And it sets up this pressure wave, which we hear as a sound wave traveling through the atmosphere surrounding the drum. This region or this stuff right here is all mechanical energy. Okay, there's the energy of vibration. Things are moving. And so there's energy, specifically mechanical energy, associated with that motion. Now, we humans can be clever at times when we want to be. And we have figured out how we can capture some of that mechanical energy and convert it into electrical energy. And a microphone is a one way in which we can do this. Now, we don't need to go into the inner workings of how a microphone does that here. Just know that it is a device that can take the mechanical energy of a sound wave and convert it into an electrical energy, into electrical energy that travels as a wave through a wire. And that's where our audio system takes over. And this is also where we start to bring back in the fact that we are talking about the science behind audio cables in this video series. Now, real life sound waves are complex. What do I mean by that? Up until this point, I have shown you models of sound waves that are just simple, clean, pure sine waves. Turns out that those pure clean sine waves are an amazingly rare phenomenon in the natural world. In fact, I don't really know if I can name a situation in which there is a naturally occurring pure sine wave tone that we don't artificially generate with some kind of electronic gizmo. And that's because there are these things called harmonics and overtones. Again, don't need to go into super depth about this, but suffice it to say that what these are is that they are additional wave information contained in vibrations. What does that mean? Well, anything that vibrates in the real world, say a guitar string, just as an example, when that guitar string is plucked, it's going to vibrate at a frequency it was designed to vibrate. Let's just call that its fundamental frequency for right now. In addition to that fundamental frequency, there are going to be higher pitches, other vibrations that result in that real world string because it was struck or plucked or strummed or something like that by a finger. The energy of that pluck is going to travel along that string in different ways. And that's going to produce additional higher frequency vibrations within that string. We call those higher frequency additional vibrations overtones. Harmonics are a special class of overtones that are integer multiples of the fundamental frequency of whatever is vibrating. So what happens then is that any naturally occurring vibration is actually going to create multiple little energy waves of different frequencies all radiating from the same spots traveling through space and time together and we're ultimately going to get a wave that looks something like this all right what is this you know that really cool bass intro played by flea from red hot chili peppers in the song higher ground well this is a graph of about 0.1 seconds worth of his bass playing from that intro I held my microphone up to a speaker and played that track right there in his cool bass intro. And then I zoomed in on that wave to capture about a tenth of a second. And this is what came out. So on the horizontal axis, we have time. And on the vertical axis, we have energy. So there are two ways that we, two things we could put on the vertical axis here. One would just be wave displacement. 
Okay, where is the string relative to its initial starting position at any given time? Or, and this is more often the case when we talk about audio measurements and that sort of thing, is we are more interested in how much energy is present in that vibration or in the signal okay, at the given time. So that's why I've put energy here on the vertical axis because that's what audacity is going to be measuring. Now that energy can be any different form. We could talk about volts, we could talk about decibels for sound intensity. There are a number of things we can put there, but they are all proxies for energy. So what we see going on here is essentially a wave that sets up during one pluck of one bass string. It's really what we're looking at here is a graphical representation of that. And what we see are two big spikes there at the beginning. And that is where his finger first plucks and puts energy into this string. And then we see the string vibrating with some energy after that. And we see a pattern here where there is kind of this bigger pattern of larger waves in there, but then riding along on top of those larger oscillations are these smaller little wiggles and zigzags and all of that going on there. All right, why does this happen? Why does a real sound wave look like this? Again, this is just one pluck of one bass guitar string doing something like this. Why, how does this happen? The answer is wave superposition. Here's what's going on. Remember, waves are traveling energy. When two or more waves overlap, meaning they exist in the same place at the same time, their energies add together. Here's a picture of that. In this little animation, we have, just for learning purposes, a stationary wave up on top, then we have a wave of equal amplitude and frequency beneath that moving left to right. And then at the bottom, is we have a wave that results from those two waves above it, if they were to exist in the same place at the same time, that's the result that we would actually hear or feel or somehow observe if we saw those two waves in the same place at the same time. Put any imaginary vertical line in here and you will see that where the thick blue wave at the bottom crosses that line, at the intersection, its distance from its axis will be the sum of where the two waves above it are each crossing that same line, right? So the position of top wave plus position of bottom wave along that dashed line equals position of the thick blue bottom wave along that line. And you can put that imaginary vertical line anywhere along here. The point is, is the bottom line, the bottom thick wave is the sum of the two waves above it. There are other ways that we can look at that. Here, we have two waves of equal frequency and amplitude moving in opposite directions. And then at the bottom, we again have the sum of those two waves. The two black dots on that wave are also there to help us remember that, hey, the material that is transmitting the wave, if there even is a material transmitting the wave, like there is with sound, but not with light, okay? It's just those are there to show us that the material itself doesn't travel with the wave. It just wiggles back and forth as the energy of the wave passes by their location. Now here's another picture. Oh. Before I move on to that, I should mention that what we see here in this image is a standing wave. And so this would be an example of what can happen when you have speakers in a room. If you get reflections off the back wall, they will start to interfere with the waves that are coming directly from the speakers. And at certain frequencies, if you let this happen over a long enough period of time, they can set up this stationary standing wave like you see with this thick blue wave on the bottom. And generally that is not good for sound. And this is one reason why speakers in rooms can be a challenge, a fun challenge, but still a challenge. In this animation, we have two waves of slightly different frequency, but same amplitude moving left to right. And then again, on the bottom, we have their sum. So again, pick any imaginary vertical line 
and where the thick blue wave at the bottom intersects that line, that point of intersection, that distance from its axis will be equal to the displacements of the two waves above it added together. You can also see here how the shape of the wave can really start to change because what we would hear if these were two tones and we were to hear this, we would not hear the two upper waves individually, we would hear the result of them superimposing on each other, which would be this lower wave. And we can see that is definitely different than any of the waves above it. So that brings us to music, right? Remember, here is that one wave from one pluck of one bass string, okay? Now think about real world music. We frequently have instruments that can play more than one tone or more than one note at the same time. Who says that you can only pluck one bass string or one guitar string at one time? Who says that you can't hit two or more keys of a piano at the same time? Then you have more instruments that you can keep adding in to have a band to have an orchestra, then we can start putting voices in. Okay, we can have a soloist, or we can have a duet, or a trio, or a full choir. We can even combine all of those instruments and all of those vocals and so forth. And remember, each naturally occurring sound from any of those instruments or any of those voices is already gonna have a fairly complex looking waveform coming from it because of overtones and harmonics existing with the fundamental frequency. Keep doing that with more instruments. Keep doing that with more voices and so on and so forth. And the waveform starts to get really, really complex. Here's an example. This is approximately one tenth of a second, same time scale as the bass string pluck I just showed you. But this is taken during a passage of the final overture of or the final few minutes of the 1812 overture as performed by Eric Kunzel and the Cincinnati Pops Orchestra. What's going on in this track at this time is a full symphony orchestra all playing. There's a in this rendition there is a full vocal choir singing away and a handbell choir all going on. And I also picked a tenth of a second that was not part of one of the real cannon fire blasts that are in this recording. But look at this, it's starting to get really complex. And again, this is just taken by me holding my microphone up to a speaker and, and recording this with Audacity, which is not super high resolution, but we can still see here that we have this pattern of some larger oscillations that look semi-repeating, but then on top of those larger oscillations, we have a bunch of smaller wiggles and they are more complex and chaotic looking than just the single bass guitar pluck up above it. If we were to zoom in even closer on this, we'd start to see that there are just more and more tiny oscillations on top of that, those even smaller oscillations. They just keep getting smaller. This is the result of wave superposition. We've got lots of instruments, lots of voices, all playing in the same place at the same time, and the energies of their vibrations traveling through the air, traveling through space and time, are all summing together by the time they reach the microphone that recorded it, or the ears that heard the performance, or anything of that nature. So these waves get really complex and there's a lot going on and there's a lot of information in there. So then we want to put that into our audio system and it needs to be carried by a wire, right? We need to take all of that mechanical energy information that was put into a microphone and converted to an electrical energy signal and put that electrical energy signal through wires, through an audio system without changing it. Does that sound hard? It's hard, okay? So we are going to talk about in a future slideshow about how those signals can be affected when they travel through a real world wire. All right, so that is the end of part two, waves and wave superposition. As I just promised, stay tuned for part three, which will be about AC signal transmission. I hope to get that out as soon as possible. 
If you have not already, please subscribe to my channel and give me a like down there. And otherwise, stay tuned for my audio equipment reviews that come out periodically as well. And as always, thanks for watching, and until next time, enjoy the music.